Well, welcome. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming indoors on this glorious day out there, but I assure you it will be well worth it. It's a fine day for science, as they say. And Paul Rose is our guest today. Um, I want to point out right away that immediately following this, there's a reception for students at the Dickey Center. It's a chance to meet Paul and to talk more about what he's done and just share time with one another. And the student reception is sponsored by the student group, the Dartmouth Coalition on Climate Change. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. I direct the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth. I'm professor in the Environmental Studies program. And this, this talk today is part of our uh, seminar series on polar science, engineering, and society. And it's part of our Eigert graduate PhD program in polar environmental change. Um, often when I get to introduce speakers, I usually have a, a litany of, of sort of degrees and affiliations and that sort of standard academic stuff. But with Paul, I think he's best introduced by really the list of things that he's done and who he is and all the different communities with whom he interacts. Um, if you want a title for Paul, he's the Royal Geographic Society's Vice President of Expeditions and Fieldwork. Um, Paul's website, and I encourage you to visit, visit his website. We're just going to bounce around the top of some of these things here. But it introduces him as a very experienced and popular public speaker, science support and field logistics expert, polar guide, professional diver and instructor, mountaineer, and yacht skipper. And it's really true. All of these things are true. Um, but it's really the interface between science and communication that, that really, uh, that's why Paul is here. And this is the interface with our programs here at Dartmouth. Um, science requires people of many different talents in order to be successful. It requires scientists, people who do support, people who communicate the science to the public. And without all these roles functioning at a high level, then the science isn't done and we don't know what scientists have contributed to society. Um, Paul's been at the front line for 30 years, um, working with scientists, communicating science on really important issues, issues around climate change, the future of the polar world, the oceans, biodiversity, acid ocean acidification. You go on, there's just a long list of things that Paul has contributed to. Um, he does this through amazing feats. They seem like feats to many of us. But for Paul, it's just doing his job and supporting science. He's inside caves, he's diving in caves, he's in cold polar waters, he's leading people in science projects on the Greenland ice sheet, on the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, he's taking youth groups across the, 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 the desert sand dunes of, of Africa to build community and international understanding around the future of the environment. Um, so how do you get into this? Well, I think Paul developed a set of mountaineering skills early on, and as he told my class this morning, his first, his first job was to figure out how to sustain this lifestyle, right? And where would it lead him? Well, it led him to the British Antarctic Survey, in part. And for 10 years, he was the base commander at Rothra, which is the main British research station on the Antarctic Peninsula. And it was, I think, really there where this interface between his support, his understanding of science, and his ability to work with people that really shone through. So at the end of 10 years there, he was awarded the, the, the British Medal by the, by the Queen, and one of the mountains in the Antarctic Peninsula is named after them. So he could check that box with, with great success. And he still works with BAS, the British Antarctic Survey. But I think it's his ability to communicate science and, and take science speak and translate it to the public where he's had his most impact. And that's led him to an amazing number of projects with BBC in particular, documentaries, uh, news reporting, specials, um, Paul's been engaged in all of this. His recent documentaries include Oceans, Exploring the Secrets of Our Underwater World, and one that, that's just amazing, Frank Wilde, Antarctica's Forgotten Hero. We both share this really strong interest in, in polar history. Um, he's, he's currently working on a whole series of projects, and the one we heard a lot about today was Ocean Debris, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to touch on this. The world's oceans are changing dramatically because of the stuff we put in there. But that stuff is also, um, can be reconfigured in interesting ways. And Paul has now become sort of an expert on debris art. And so make sure you ask him about that. I think this is a, a really interesting new field for him. Um, his, his, his voice is known everywhere, certainly, certainly in, in Great Britain, but around the world, as someone talking with scientists and about science to the public. And I think one of the favorite things that he's done is one of my heroes is Robert Falcon Scott, the, the, the uh, second to the South Pole. 
And, um, but but uh, Paul got to do the voiceover on his diaries for the British uh, uh, Library of History. And, and that's a very special thing to be selected. He's such a hero and icon in Britain. To be chosen to, to be that person is quite a high honor. Um, so um, when Paul uh, was arriving in Hanover, we had dinner last night with a colleague. And, and he said, well, you know, who is this guy? How would you describe him? And I thought for a minute. And I said, well, I think he's sort of equal parts Jacques Cousteau, Sir Edmund Hillary, and Robert Falcon Scott. And, and I think by the time we're done with this, you're going to see all three of these elements come out. Um, so just a quick story. I first met Paul in Antarctica. Um, he was working, supporting a science group high up in the Taylor Glacier. And they were doing this really hard physical work, extracting ice and melting it, and a big crew, international crew, working in a really difficult place. I was working in Taylor Valley, down on the valley floor, um, where it's, I was with a permanent camp there, the weather's nice, it's fairly benign. I was sort of like the equivalent of Club Med, while Paul was way up on top of the glacier. And one of the things we have to do is every morning you have to call into the base and tell everyone that we're all alive, we're still getting along, you know, what do you need, what don't you need? So um, my group, someone would crawl out of their tent and kind of, oh, I got to do radio comms, and they call, they check into McMurdo, and they give this very quick, yeah, we're here, we're okay, you know, talk to you tomorrow. And then shortly after, this, this booming, energetic, amazing voice would rumble down the valley that we could hear on the radio. And it would say, it would say it's a fine day for science up here on Taylor Glacier. And of course, of course it was Paul. And you'll, you'll see in a minute what, what I'm saying here. And so um, uh, that, that was my introduction to Paul, was his voice in Taylor Valley, Antarctica, and with this great enthusiasm for doing science and being with scientists. So to this day, when I'm in Taylor Valley with my team and it's kind of a hard day, the wind's blowing, we're a little hungry, and I work in the soil, so often we're just on our hands and knees and looking at the ground and doing this and forgetting where we are. And someone will just kind of stand up to stretch and kind of look around and you see the Asgard Mountains and you see the glaciers and you look up and you see the Taylor Glacier and they'll say, it's a fine day for science. <laughs> so that's your legacy. I want to thank you for that. That will continue forever among the McMurdo LTER group. So it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to have Paul here and to, to learn more about what he's doing. And um, the title of this presentation today, it's got a, a lot of scary words in it. It's From the Arctic to the Ocean, Exploring Hot Topics in Cold, Dark, Deep, and Dangerous Places. So please join me in a really warm welcome for Paul Rose. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. That was lovely, thank you. <laughs> oh, great, well follow that, as they say. Yeah. Thanks very much for a warm welcome, Ross, and thanks for coming on such a great day. I'm not sure I would have come myself, but, uh, <laughs> but thanks a lot. Um, you know, as Ross says, I, I spend a lot of time in the polar regions, and, I, and, I, and this is my main love, you know, looking after scientists, working with scientists in what I call the science support industry. I absolutely love it. Um, I spend a lot of time guiding in the mountains, mostly in the Greenland now. I mean, you know, guiding in, in the European Alps and guiding in South America, and guiding in North America, you end up climbing routes that pretty much lots of people have done lots of times, and it'd be a bit of a sort of timetable thing going on. But guiding, private guiding in Greenland is beautiful. You can climb new peaks, new summits, travel, you know, untraveled, unground truthed, unmapped glacier systems. And as Ross kindly said, I was the base commander of Rothera Research Station for 10 years um, in Antarctica. Um, and I spend a lot of time communicating, whether it's uh, one hour specials or half hour specials or big documentaries or news appearances, I'm always trying to communicate either an important science matter or a piece of uh, factual story or some sort of global issue to people, often to millions of people, which is a great um, privilege and a great piece of excitement. You think, well, I'm communicating to millions of people, so you've got to get it right. And I've learned that communication is, is my main strength. I love to communicate. I love the challenge of communicating. And it often, I think I've learned it by getting myself in real fixes. I know what it's like when you communicate to, to Tibetans that, that they can have champagne. Not all of it, but if they get all the expedition champagne four months too early, then you don't have much of an expedition. I've learned what it's like to be nearly killed by your doctor on the north side of Everest when I've got it all wrong and I thought he meant put all his gear on this yak 
and it all went on the wrong yak, and that's him at 22,000 feet wearing a plastic bag, very, very pissed off. Um, <laughs> and, and I know what it's like to, to have these sort of language difficulties that we take for granted. Um, uh, this is Denali, uh, the, the West Buttress. I've, I've worked on it uh, 13 times, been to the summit six. And those of you that know it, um, there's 14,000, there's the Cahillotna Glacier, windy corner around the corner. And this is halfway up the hairball, and you, you probably know that uh, the normal routine is to, is to leave here quite uh, light. It's the first time the personality of the mountain changes, and then go up the hairball to 17.2 for the summit bid. Um, but with this case, I had one, got one client. It was my first time with a sort of private client who had a lot of money and was just going to pay me to just be a one-on-one -on -one situation. And I thought that was a big deal for me then because I've been guiding groups, you know, sort of, you know, sort of earned me stripes going that way. And this, this guy was a pretty okay climber, but he had that funny thing with his hands that they never really warmed up. And he was also very slow getting going. And I was all fired up because this was our move up. And I remember, I remember Dave being around the back there, having gone to do a number two. And, um, and I was stood for ages. And you know, you sort of strip down to I was ready to move. I was dressed to move. And I had his end of the rope, and I was cold, and let's get moving. Um, and I heard him shouting. I thought, God, well, you know, surely he hasn't fallen down the bergs around here. He what's happened to David? And I could hear him shouting. And I got a bit closer. I said, what's going on? And I heard him say, I've just shit in my hood. I remember thinking, <laughs> God, did he, did he say he's just shit in his hood? And I, so I got closer and closer. And, I, and then in England, we have this thing like, if Ross said to me, oh, your computer's burned up or something, I would say, you're kidding. Meaning like, oh God, oh wow, you know, I'd say. So I, he said it again, and I said, you're kidding. And he came to me, and it, he was, face was about this far from mine. He was dripping with poo. He'd done the old thing where the, <laughs> the, hood, the hood had gone in between his legs. He hadn't noticed it with the cold hands, and flipped it up. And with all this poo dripping down him, and me as a new guide, he said, do I look as if I'm fucking kidding with this? And, and I remember thinking, well, there you go. You, know, you need to learn about communication. So the theme of my talk today is about the importance of communicating and my part in it and the sort of tricks or equations or grooves we have to find to, to communicate complex issues, not the least of which is science. Um, but I feel that you, you need to know something about me. Um, I learned in Alaska about five years ago, the Alaska Forum on the Environment, from this lovely, little, old, um, very powerful, beautiful Alaskan lady and I'm not sure if Alaskan Inuit or how, how the tribal things fitted. But she was fantastic. It was a big audience of about 1,200 people. There was the EPA there. There was business. There was BP. There was all the oil and gas people, <coughs> Shell. And there was a large group of native Alaskans. And she came up and told me, I was doing the keynote, and there was this big thing on the Alaskan Forum for the Environment. And she said, do you know what we like? She said, we, we like it if we learn something about you before you start speaking. And, and I thought that was really nice. What a lovely way of introducing, because then rather than sit back and say, here's something to do with communication, you know, who is this bloke standing in front of you, Paul Rose? And to capture it, I've put this up, because I'm defined by diving. I do a lot of other stuff, uh, mostly in the polar regions, but diving is the activity and the thing that keeps me going. It's, the, a, defining, it's a defining activity, it's a defining and dare I say, it's a beautiful uh, moment for me when I'm in, in the water. Um, and I clearly remember the day I was 11, and um, on television was Jacques Cousteau living the ultimate dream of travelling around the world on Calypso with his men. There, it already was living under the Red Sea, you know, on Conshelf 2. He'd co-invented scuba diving. And Hans Huss had made those fantastic black and white shark documentaries, really beautiful, wearing the old ex-military equipment. And this man, you know, there he is, you know, Mike Nelson, as played by Lloyd Bridges on Sea Hunt, was popping up on my television every week. Although we didn't get it every week in England, we got it sort of every other week or something. And he was having proper blokes diving adventures. You know, he was rescuing people from crashed airplanes, rescuing people from flooded mines. And all the beautiful women in the world wanted Mike to teach him to dive. And I was 11, living, in a, living, living just east of London, long way from the sea, and I'd just failed this terrible thing called the 11 plus. In those days, when you were 11, you had to take an, an exam. And, and everybody passed this exam, and then you went off into the right school. It was a bit of a filter system. Um, but even my Herbert mates all passed this exam, and I managed to fail it. 
Um, so that meant there was, there was all these good schools and the sort of okay ones and the ones where we need a bit of help. And then there was these ones over here where no one went to. Well, I went there. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I know nothing in life except I want to be a diver. And I clearly remember it. And, and in fact, it was, it was when I was 17, I actually became a diver. And I'd been done my swimming pool work and diving in the quarries and learnt everything. And finally, you get to go in the sea as a diver. And because I dreamed about this so intensely, that first dive was exactly as I knew it was going to be. I knew exactly what that sea was going to feel like when it came in. I knew, I knew exactly how it was going to feel to see the weed moving around, the crabs on the bottom. And it was the first time in my life I really felt that vital freedom that we get when we're doing exactly what we want to do alongside nature. And it was a marvellous moment. She'll never forget it. And I, and I think that's a way for you to... Um, here, who is this bloke, Paul Rose, mucking around talking about science in the polar regions. But if you did ask me to choose something, I would say, I'm a diver. Um, and then last year, up in Greenland, um, I was very lucky. I mean, you might think, well, here's a guy that's been working in Greenland since 2000, sometimes three times a year, nearly always in support of science, but I still guide up there. So does it all get a bit sort of like routine? Does it all get a bit of, you know, ticking the boxes and it's just a piece of professional work? And here I was last year in June, and when I got back from this journey, it was a five and a half week journey in Greenland, I must say, I actually remember thinking, this is the most beautiful journey I've ever made. And there's something about that, I mean, I'm 61, I've been a guide since 1979, so I've had loads of journeys, all kinds of journeys, all over the place, but there was something beautiful about this. And what it was, it was really quite a simple journey. Um, there's a map of Greenland, and we went from... Uh, there, Constable Point, down the coast um, to the Watkins Mountains and climbed Gumbionfjord, the highest in the Arctic. And this route, this 275 kilometres, had never been travelled. I'd been to the Watkins before, lots of people go to the Watkins, normally fly in on a ski equipped to an otter, but no one had looked at the map and thought, hey, no one skied in from Constable Point and travel, you know, Nud Rasmussen land, untravelled ice caps, unnamed, unground truth glacier systems, and I had a beautiful team, I just had three clients, so that meant it was four of us, two tents, and we could travel light, we travelled quite fast and efficiently, and seemingly every day, we had perfect weather, uh, we climbed new peaks, and when we got to the, uh, the two ice caps that had never been traversed, we, we named them, all that lovely thing about naming your, naming your peak, um, and then when we got to Gumbion Fjeld, the highest in the Arctic, it was in such good condition that the north face route that I put up in 2002 was in great condition and I led us up there and we climbed that. And it's, the point I'm making is that even though I've been guiding all these years, so many thousands of days in these regions, there's something great about looking back and thinking, hey, you know, it still means a lot to me. It was a beautiful, beautiful journey. Um, I love being in Greenland. Um, I'm up there for science mostly and private guiding. And as Ross was saying, that I, my journey that I do a lot is the ice cap crossing. I was the first to lead it commercially. It's a lovely route, it's Nansen's old route, you know, a Masalik to Kangulaswak. And depending how you go, it's around about 500 kilometers. Um, it's, a, it's a great journey and it's something I'm really good at. It's a, it's a long, mindless, physical grunt. And it's nice to have these little niches where you can say, you know what, I'm really good at that, and say, I'm good at a long, mindless, physical grunt for about five weeks. It's a, it's a tremendous journey. Um, um, it's, it's a long way. You pull a sledge, weighs about 105 kilos, um, and typically I'll take five clients. The idea behind that is that then we can go in three tents, and it's a good weight and energy balance. And it almost doesn't work. It's so beautiful. It's so far, and when you start the journey, you're on the east coast. It's uphill. The snow's at its softest. It's warm. The sledges are at their heaviest. And let's face it, you're sort of fresh out the box. You sort of, well, here we go, and away we go. And we set a system up where we sort of ski for nine hours. So six of us, that's each one of us in front for an hour and a half. And eventually after nine hours, um, you're as far as you're ever going to be that day, completely exhausted, so camp up and keep moving. Well, in those first days, everyone's absolutely exhausted. The hips, the backs, everything's just sort of getting used to pulling the loads. And you've only gone like eight kilometres. And it's crazy, you look at the map and you think, this is a disaster, because we, here's the map, and here's us. <laughs> and, it, and it's so little progress that if, you, if you're out by 15 or 20 degrees, it doesn't matter. 
you know, who'd have thought it? So you can ski along, and if, if I can see someone in front being driven completely batty by trying to ski straight, and they don't need me yelling at the back, left a bit, right a bit, um, then I just tell them, doesn't matter. You can be off as much as you like, because we're making such little progress, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so can you imagine the, the massive demotivator? You know, these people have spent a lot of money, and you're telling them, we're, we're getting no progress. <laughs> But anyway, we, we know when it, eventually that same amount of effort every day, your sledges get lighter, you reach over the summit, you come down the other side, and you normally, coming down the west side, we've got a tailwind and we can get the kites up and really make some big distance, sometimes even as much as 90 kilometres in a day. So it does work. It, it's, it's a whole magic sort of emotional process getting across Greenland. Um, and I'm often asked, who does it? Who, who comes on these trips? Are they all wealthy Lunatics, are they? People that have all been to the North Pole, South Pole, looking for another big ski target. Um, who does it? And I, it's all those things. But I always like to talk about this guy, who, he was one of these people who was very passionate, super keen to do it, but had no skill set at all. Um, in fact, three weeks into the trip, I was still shouting at him to put his skis on the other feet. You know, we tell him about skis, you can put them on the wrong feet. And I'd be thinking, there's something funny about Dave. And I'd get up there and his skis would be on the wrong feet. When we were training in Norway, he, he was clumsy. Stuff was blown away. He could, couldn't really get the tent sorted. And, but he had a magic about him that I thought, well, it's worth sticking with. Uh, let, let's bring him on the trip. Um, and it got worse when we got to Greenland because he insisted on putting the old white zinc oxide stuff, the greasy, and it was dripping off his nose. And it was, uh, so it made him clumsier and harder to put the tents up. And... And I shared a tent with him. Obviously, you think, well, he's the weakest in the group. I'll share the tent with him. And it was a problem because it meant I had not much space. He was a big guy, so he took up all the damn tent. Uh, I often, I meant I had every alternate day when it was his turn to cook, I had zinc oxide in me porridge and my water. And, you know, and, I thought, and, it, and I thought, well, sooner or later, I was working very hard to keep, keep on top of managing this guy. And I thought, well, I'll start, if I accept that I hate him, it's all right, because then I've sort of given off that bit of energy. So I thought, right, I hate him. Yeah, it was great. And it was great every day. I thought, right, you, you know. And <laughs> over the next sort of middle part of the weeks, when like, a lot of spare gear was, you know, he was coming out of my pulp to him because he was breaking or losing stuff. And I thought, there's only so much to go. And he's a big, unsupported, risky journeys. I thought, well, maybe I could just, I could kill him. And it's the first time in my life <laughs> that I thought, that's it. I'm going to murder him. And... And I figured, who would know? A piece of cake. You know, I could say, well, I told him not to go over there. He went down a caress. He's gone. <laughs> and, and I was fantasizing over this for a few days. And I, suddenly, you know, sense came that, that, hang on, you better talk to him. And as we're about three weeks into this trip, so we've still got a hard week to get off. And I, in many ways, that last week is hard because we've lost a bit of weight. Injuries are kicking in a bit. Um, you know, all the sort of food is getting a bit thin. There's a sense of, wow, we've got to get off this ice cap. And I sat down with him and I explained all. I didn't tell him I was going to murder him. <laughs> but I had a good thought of being about it. And I just said, you know, Dave, you've got to sort yourself out. And I think the main thing, rather than tell you 20 things, is just don't put this sun cream on so thick. Just do it, you know, because it's the ultimate disaster. You know, I'm talking to a guy with it dripping off his nose. And he said, no, he said, he said I've got to put this on because I've telephoned in sick from work and I can't go home with a suntan. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I immediately, so I went, I went from hating this guy, wanting to murder him, to I fell in love with him. I thought, what a great guy. I, just, I said, he loved him. He was using the satellite phone about every three days. And I, that was another thing that drove me nuts. I'd get the satellite phone back all greasy and assumed he was calling his girlfriend. But he, he was actually calling in sick. Um, so that sense of commitment and personal engagement was, meant everything to me. And these are the kind of people that I love. Uh, to deal with. And that, that sense of beauty and vitality and exposure that we get in the outdoors does have a double-edged sword, as we, as we all know. This is, this is us on Gumbion Field, the highest in the Arctic, um, and beautiful mountain. And this is us coming up the final ridge from the north face down over here. And when I first had a team uh, together to climb it, they were clients who were technically brilliant, the opposite of they. They were just unbelievably great. But, you know, I would not hazard I guess they were I'm sure they're technically more competent than I I was at the time but they weren't the Greenland experience so there was a sense of well we better hire somebody to go climb the north side of Gumbion field and I'd always wanted to do it I knew it was unclimbed 
So we looked at the maps, looked at the photographs, and you know, with a new route, it's hard to tell where those, where that route might be. Where's the weaknesses? Where's the strengths? Where's the dangers? The funny old satellite images with clouds on them, and you know, bad photographs. So we said it was worth a go. So I got there. We did the usual kind of thing, moved up in fairly flat weather, expecting the good weather to get better, and I found myself for the first time in my life being pushed by the clients. And normally I'm really good at saying, well, look, pff, hang on, you know. But I stupidly thought, well, I'll keep at it then. I thought, I'll keep at it. I could, couldn't quite see where we were. And, you know, it was getting high, big winds. It was really, really cold. It was always minus 30. It was windy. There was a lot of snow aloft. And when I was calling back for weather, they said, well, pff, it's not going to get any better. So after about a week and a half of picking and finding my way around, I realised we were getting near the summit. And I said, well, let's just go. Well, let's you know, strip down, we'll go. And it was a day of power, you know, big gaps coming in the clouds and snow aloft and spin drift everywhere. And we could see bits, patches. So we went for it and summited. And I remember being on the summit thinking, all I want to do is get down. Just get down from here. And while we were there, my son who'd come along to help, and I'm doing the obvious, trying to get pictures, get people to put the gloves back on, let's go down, looking for the route. Scott said, Hey, that, he said, what's that up there then? <laughs> and quite obviously, uh, we'd, I'd led us all up the wrong mountain. And, uh, <laughs> and I'd, uh, I'd climbed that one right there. And, um, and you'll see that on the Danish maps that that's, that's now known, that, that's called Paul's Mirage, that mountain. <laughs> I'd got turned around on this ridge down there. I'd climbed the hard bit, got turned around on this ridge and made good progress convincing myself we came over that thing, oddly enough. Um, so you can't hide, can you? You can't suddenly say, well, it's, it's, it's government policy or it's work policy or, you know, the dog ate it or any terrible excuses. <laughs> You've got to stand there in front of the clients and say, yep, we've just climbed the wrong mountain. I'm so sorry. Um, um, so, so then we did come down, and as you can see by this picture, we did actually make it. Uh, it took us a week to get organised back at base camp and come up. And it's that sense of risk that isn't just the risk of you might fall off something or in something or someone might hit you or you get cold injuries or something, it's the personal risk that always excites me. It's that lovely sense of exposure. You say, well, here I am. You know, you're right. We have just climbed the wrong mountain. You can't, uh, you, can't, you can't hide it. So it's that sense of energy from nature that I assume everybody gets excited about. But when, when I communicate it um, via television documentaries or the news or uh, speaking engagements like this, I sometimes find it very hard to communicate issues on the ocean. It's me that's passionate about the ocean, not necessarily the audience out there. And we've all, you know, we've all seen these pictures, you know, the great Pacific um, uh, rubbish gyre, these pictures of these, um, you know, this thing in the Philippines, th this mass of plastic that exists, and these horrible pictures of these birds who, who peck away at all the objects in the sea, and they can't tell the difference, and taking in, they said, taking all the things that, that we know, plastic bottle tops and all the rest of it, it fills up their guts and, and they explode. So how to, when I speak to people about the, the largest ecosystem on the planet, which is the oceans, and 99% of the space on the planet is the sea, and how little we know about it, when, I, when you add on top of that the, the tons and tons and tons of rubbish that goes in the sea, the problem is so vast, it sort of roots us into immobility. You know, people just go, well, pff, nothing we can do. It's a, can't get my head around it. So I've been hunting for ages as a way to bring it to life. So working with my colleagues in Switzerland, they came up with the idea that um, in Zurich, of all places, you know, in Switzerland, you know, an enclave, landlocked country, they thought they could provide ocean leadership, and I loved it. Because it immediately asks the question, what's Switzerland doing providing ocean leadership? Well, one thing, a few years ago, they won the America's Cup, so that's one thing. About but um, even if you ignore that, because we're asking the question, how is it? that the Swiss would get engaged in ocean leadership. The fact we're asking the question, from a television and radio broadcasting point of view, that's great, because people are opened up a little bit. So a bunch of us got a load of debris from Hawaii, the North Sea and the Black Sea, and piled it up in the main hall of the Zurich Museum of Design. And that was about as sensible as we could make this pile. Um, and when we got it piled up, we got all the scientists together and said, how much is it? And they worked out with all the remote sensing and computer modelling and as best ground truthing as possible that that's what goes in the sea every 15 seconds. 
so even if it's off by a fair bit, let's say it's 45 seconds, but it could equally be 10 seconds. It's, it's a lot of rubbish going in the sea. And it's a beautiful exhibit down this side of the halls. There's all that computer modeling, how we know where it comes from, how much comes out the rivers. And, and then down this side is the uh, more sort of industrial piece, which is our relationship with plastic. You know, it's a great product. We can't do without it, but it's once we've got it, what do we do with this stuff? It becomes a, you know, we each become the sort of owner of a, of a piece of hazardous material and how responsible should we feel and all of that. It's a lovely. So I was so excited by it that uh, I managed to work with a, a, the Drossos Foundation and we're going to run it. It's now in Hamburg and it's running around Europe and I'm the one that's bringing it to, to London um, in autumn of next year at the Royal Geographical Society. We're lucky there because our main entrance, the new one, is all glass and it will fill it. So it, it will look to the passers-by that, wow, the Royal Geographical site is full of flipping plastic. What's going on? So we think we're going to get a lot of interest. Um, I followed that up by um, diving in Lake Geneva. I spent a lot of time in Switzerland, and we, we got about 110 divers, and we all swam around the bottom of Lake Geneva, gathering all the stuff that shouldn't be in there. Um, and, of course, you can't go wrong, classic Geneva. You know, I did a bit for television before I went in, and the radio were there. And I explained that we're going to get this stuff, and we're going to turn it into beautiful objects after, you know, fish, ducks, geese, and swans, and use, we're going to auction them for um, an ocean awareness charity. And I did all that and sort of waved goodbye to the camera. And you know what it's like when you're diving, you're sort of standing here. So I went down like that, and only went there, and I found a handbag full of money. So only in Geneva, you know. So I came back up, I said, I'm sorry about it, handbag full of money, you know. And we, we carried on, and we swam around and gathered all the things, you know, Vespers and and shopping trolleys and plastic and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it was made by youngsters into these beautiful um, objects. I was really excited about it because it means that people are then asking, the question, why are you swimming around in a lake picking up rubbish when you're talking about the ocean? And that's lovely because you've got there asking a question. And we can say, well, it's so vast, we can actually touch it and feel this, as well as cleaning up the lake and making the point, don't throw stuff in the lake. We're engaged in marine debris somehow. Um, and then um, I wrote about it in a magazine and said I'm going to do it in my hometown of Windermere, which is the Lake District in England. We, it's the home of England's largest lake. It's a real sense of national pride. And yet we tend to treat it um, a, bit, a bit like a bottomless pit for our waste. Some people throw stuff in. So I did some stuff on television, um, swam around with a big team, picking up things like whole toilets and car batteries. Um, we had 262 divers. Um, from all over the, uh, Britain, so it made it the largest of its kind. And we had 400 shore-based and boat-based volunteers, and we collected tons and tons of, of rubbish, um, about 10 tons of rubbish. We were lucky enough to get the good television coverage, including National Geographic. And with all that rubbish, our goal is to make these beautiful objects. Um, you know, something about art, isn't there? If you look at a beautiful object and think, oh my God, it's made out of car tyres and, and, and plastic bottles and all the rest of it. Um, or if you, my favourite at the moment is, is that we're doing a test where you walk into a studio and here's all the horrible bits that you can't do much with, you know, cr um, um, you know chip packets and, and all nasty little horrible grotty bits of plastic and everything. It looks just like a horrible pile, but then when you turn the light off, the other light comes on, which is a spotlight, and the artwork is the shadow that's projected. And they've been very clever with that. And then there's a big team that's going to build the largest piece of debris art in the world. Um, and that's going to, we're going to finish that June 22nd, just after, um, just, just before, rather, World Oceans Day. And it happens to be Kurt Schwitter's birthday. And if you haven't heard of him, he's the, he's the famous father of debris art, apparently. I didn't heard of him either. So there you go. That's our plan. And it's a way of engaging people with um, ocean debris issue. And as Ross Kiney said, I've, I've been doing a lot of work on it. I'm just back from Hong Kong on a project there, and I go back again, World Oceans Day, 7th and 8th of June, on a big um, ocean debris art project. So this meant we got good coverage, and from that, I got my new television documentary, which is this project here, where we're, there's this company called Ecova, who make um, um, household cleaning goods, and they've come up with an idea that they pay fishermen to bring in plastic they find from the sea. Normally it's discarded, of course. It's a real problem when you're going out fishing and you're trying to get fish and you get all this debris in the net as well. Um, they pay them for, their, for this 
and then it goes then to a reprocessing plant in London and that gets turned into the bottles that has the domestic cleaning information. It's very clever stuff. So I'm doing a television project on that coming up as a way to communicate the sort of weirdness. I'm going to do some, or I've done one day's filming already. I'm going to do a day where I do some autopsies on seabirds because they're found in seabirds and fish, the tiny little pellets that you use as abrasive soap, you know, exfoliant soaps and whatnot. Those, some of those are plastic and they're tiny. They don't break down and they become like little micro pollutants that go in the birds and the fish. So the way of doing that is I'm going to do some autopsies on some uh, seabirds. Um, so we need these constant little tricks to keep the audience involved. So I'm going to be cutting up a bird and some people go, oh, God, what's he doing that for? And I, um, but at least they'll be listening to my ocean debris message. And similarly, when, when I did the program on Nansen, you know, my big polar hero, uh, I've been lucky enough to do quite a number of these um, historical um, explorer documentaries. And Nansen, I thought, would be an easy one to do because I know his stories, I know everything about this man and we filmed in Norway all over the place. We were well up in Arctic Norway and Svalbard and I must say it was an easy delightful piece because the audience got the message and it was well written, I knew it and it was a great few weeks producing this, uh, 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 presenting this documentary. But there was one moment where we needed the innovative communication that I'm talking about. We, there's all these hero shots and if you, if you see it, you see me on, I've run dogs for years in Antarctica um, till we had to get rid of them in 94 and I'm whizzing past the camera running dogs doing these bits to camera and the classic sort of hero shots there he goes again wow I'm doing fantastic but it was a complete nightmare because I got there we got the dogs and this lovely old Norwegian who showed us the dogs and I got on them and I couldn't run them it never happened to me before in my life I'm, I'm used to running dogs um, who, who, who speak English if you like <laughs> <laughs> so you can shout left and right, and hut dogs to go, and whoa, to stop. Um, and, even, and even if they're sort of from different parts, you can still get by running dogs. They sort of tend to think, oh, this one knows what he's doing. But I couldn't, I, couldn't. I was whizzing around in circles. They were going over there. It was a complete disaster. With the short daylight, it was a real nightmare. So in the end, the, the old boy, he was getting a bit frustrated. I was getting embarrassed. Uh, the crew... You could see the film crew thinking, that's funny, I thought he knew what he was doing. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. So in the end, I got the, I got the guy, and he was, although he was an old guy, but he was, he was a tall, fit, and I got him, and I, and I said, the only way we're going to do this is, you can't quite see it, but on the, on the sled there is a bag. I said, I was, I'll get you in that bag, you know. I said, tell you what, every time I, hear, every time I say something, and you shout it in Norwegian. So we did. So for two hours... This poor old guy laid in the bag and I shouted, you know, left, you know, run to the, run to the dogs. And it worked a treat. And I remember letting him out after two hours and he, he said, you know, that was the worst two hours of my life, he said. <laughs> but, but at least it meant I could do the documentary and look as, look as, look as if I was some sort of hero whilst talking about um, my polar hero. Similarly with Frank Wilde, I mean, this was a beautiful documentary. We had no idea that the, that the Frank Wilde story was so rich. He, he was everyone's sort of second in command. Shackleton, Scott, Mawson, they all loved him. He was a technical genius. He could do sort of anything. He sort of, in the polar regions, he was in his, in his prime. He could do anything. He could just, his element was the polar regions. But no one had really ever heard of him. And then, interestingly enough, um, there was a story that he died in Africa, but they'd lost his ashes. So where was he? So with some help, we managed to find his ashes. And his dream was to be buried on South Georgia next to, the sh next to Shackleton, the boss, as he called him. You know, that was a great love between these two men, and, you know, he wanted to be there. So we, on television, were able to go find these ashes, tell the whole African story, and then bring him to the Antarctic, uh, bury him next to Shackleton, and then go down onto the Plinza and tell the whole Antarctic journey. So it's a lovely bit of television when you get lucky like that, because you don't need to work very hard at communicating, because the story tells for itself. The more you know about it, the more... You love him, and you don't have to be interested in polar stuff to find the story very interesting. Um, but it was my first time doing television on a tourist ship. There's not much money floating around at the moment, as you know. So in the old days, we'd have had our own dedicated ship and helicopters and heaven knows what, but the, the story was we could go down on a tourist ship. And fair enough, why not? You know, live in a bit of luxury and uh, uh, travel on the tourist ship. But what soon came to light is that when... You're on a tourist ship. When you get off the ship, 
there's 110 people wearing red jackets with you. So every time we try to get a bit of peace and quiet, and we'd leg it around the corner and try and try and do something, there'd be people in the background. So when you look at that film, as well as I hope enjoy the film, you'll see that actually a lot of my pieces to camera are a bit obscure in the background. That's because we hit on the idea of me standing on bits of floating ice and then no one else could get out there and I could deliver these fantastic bits to camera about being anywhere other than on a bit of ice. But it was a way of, way of getting uh, the message across um, uh, without upsetting um, our, our tourist friends. And when, I, when I'm at work, I'm often, you know, Ross and I, we can be having a beer together and we talk about problems and uh, things that we've overcome and challenges that we've faced and how we managed to get through it. And that's natural human conversation. Um, and I do it a lot on this project here. You, you may not recognise this submarine or this man here, Anatoly Sagalevich, my colleague, but you might recognise that picture because that's the picture of the Russian flag being planted under the North Pole about seven years ago in the great geopolitical claim. And it's this submarine and Anatoly that did it. Um, and I had the opportunity of working in Geneva, that's Geneva there, um, working on this micro-pollutant project, you know, for years. I mean, mid-sized European lakes, there's a lot of people living around them, there's been a lot of industry, and for years there's been pharmaceutical products that's gone into Lake Geneva. And there was, they were keen to measure what effect this might have. I mean, the horrible things, antibiotics, hormones, you name it. But if you measure from the surface, it's a deep lake, 300 metres, you can't quite tell where you're, in what part of the water column your Nansen bottle or other sampling device really is. Because that water column is very active. You might be at the same depth, 50 metres, say, but because that column is moving with the algal bloom, they said, we want to get that bit in the algal bloom and see how it actually fits. And is it really impossible? It's too deep to dive, 300 metres, and particularly they wanted uh, core samples. So I got together with Anatoly and Ferring Pharmaceuticals, and EPFL, where we're going to go, um, and brought the whole thing over to Lake Geneva, and we did the classic thing of ground truthing it. The only way to measure that is to ground truth it. So we got this tiny mass spectrometer from Woods Hole, and I promised not to break it, and we clamped that onto the side. And Anatoly looked after all the diving, and I looked after all the science support, meaning to make sure every dive was as full as it could be of science equipment, and ran the ran the core sampler and all this kind of business. And I did that for the whole summer two years ago. And me and Anatoly would be there in a two meter sphere. And then all the gubbins, all the technical stuff is also inside that two meters. And it'd be me and Anatoly, you see it's quite a big fella. And we'd be jammed up like that with our knees interlocked for six hours. And we'd have these great discussions. And I used, he used to ask me questions about climbing and mountaineering and bivouacking and sailing. And, couldn't get a word in. And one day, I, I said to her, I said, Anna's Holly, when you're stuck, like when they were on the North Pole, they had a lot of trouble coming up because the ice had moved and their radar had broke. And it, there's, there's big dramas on the Titanic and, and he's got a big team and there's a lot of financial risk as well. I said to him, how do you get by? How do you do these things? How do you communicate all these complicated issues? How do you keep the team motivated? And, you know, how do you actually do this? And he just got his business card out and he said, that's how I do it. And it says on there, Anatoly Sagalevich, hero of Russia. He said, that's all you need to know. And I remember thinking, God, imagine that. Imagine, imagine if you could do all these great things just by sort of magically being a hero. But it's not the way we live. It's certainly the way not I live. I need to constantly hunt for tricks and methods and equations to get large numbers of people to hear these messages. And my passion is the ocean. Um, as a young boy of 11, I wouldn't have known this, that 99% of the place on the planet um, is the ocean. You know, you three-dimension the whole thing. That's how big the ocean is. It's, it's almost immeasurable. And, and I always used to say less than 10% has been explored. And then just recently, NOAA came up and said it's 5%. And this consortium called Ocean Leadership are a really good bunch. Um, on there is Sylvia Earle and all this great group. Said it's about 5% of the ocean floor and look at that, less than half the percent of the water. So that's how vast and how difficult it is to met, work and understand the oceans. Um, and then even more so, there's probably people here that contributed to this. I did the World Ocean Census, a 10-year interdisciplinary multinational project. Brilliant, 10 years, World Ocean Census. So there was big projects, nearshore marine projects, you name it, all at sea for 10 years. 
And we had this enormous party afterwards in the Natural History Museum of, of London. I highly recommend that place for a party, by the way, because there's if you're trying to find somebody and it's enormous and everyone's buzzing, you can, you can text them, you can say, I'm drinking champagne under the backside of the Brontosaurus. And say, oh, yeah, there you are, I'll come and find you. And Norm was all the great and good said about what they did. You know, we'd found 6,500 new species, thousands of kilometres of ground truth, ocean currents, new ocean current, particularly the Australian current, um, the ocean abyss um, more accurately mapped, you know, big celebration. And I asked the question, obviously, you know, predictably enough, what about this 10% number as it changed? They said, oh, no, we're a long way from anything like understanding 10%. So I get really excited about that great unknown. So when it came to do this big series called Oceans, I mean, it's eight one hours, um, I had the promise of the money, but not the money. We had the promise of discovery coming in as a partner with BBC. Could we actually do eight one hours about the oceans? And I remember thinking, we've got it. But I went back to BBC and they said, well, we've got it if, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> and, and the if was, can you find a better way to communicate this? Can you bring things into a human scale? And I remember and I'd spent you know, a year and a half putting this thing together. Um, and I would constantly stand in front of them, sort of foam at the mouth and do all these great things, but I couldn't get them to totally commit. So I said, we need a way for you to tell us that's very different. And I went in the end, I thought, well, I'll talk about the Mediterranean, because in Europe we tend to think of the Mediterranean as our local sea, we know everything about it. But not many people understand that through the course of history it's been up, down, somewhere in the middle, it's been at a lot of different levels. And I thought that was an important consideration when we went to each part of the sea. So I went to Mallorca and there's a series of caves that I know a little bit about that the scientists are working in. And where they find all these lovely, interesting formations, those of you that are cavers will know that you, those formations, these pillars and stalactites and stalagmites, only form in air. So by swimming past them, for a start, it means I can make the point that the water must have been a lot lower. And then where these, and you can see the things like this, you got, I had this idea that people would be watching the television, half of them saying, wow, great, I'd love to be in there. The other half going, oh my God, I wouldn't do that for anything. But at least they're watching the flipping television and I can talk about sea level change. And in particular, there's some beautiful formations coming up, a small picture of it here, where they've discovered that these lumps that form up on these formations are indicators as to where at some point it was air and then water and other places where it was fresh water and salt water. They do that by doing chemistry on these lumps. From the, from the ceiling of the cave, water drips down and brings with it calcite and when that water in the cave is so very still, the calcite forms into like little ice flows and sits there. And then when the water changes, it sticks to the columns, up or down, and they can measure it. And I, I tried to do this on a computer model, and I could see people falling asleep as I was explaining it. I was getting really excited. But by swimming around in these areas, it almost gives people like me a license to tell a very, very powerful story. And this was one of the big tricks. And I remember this was the film we made. I took it back to BBC and I said, right, here you go. And we plugged it in. And it, sure enough, it worked to treat exactly as I'd hoped um, it might work for the main audience. And that was that half of the commissioners were on the edge of their seat going, wow, this is beautiful. I'm getting it. I'd love to be there. The other half of the commissioning team did literally have their hands over their eyes thinking, oh, my God, we're going to pay this guy to, to carry out this sort of um, crazy behaviour but at least they were watching the screen whilst I talked about past sea level uh, rises and the fact that the Med at one point was damn near dry um, by diving in these kinds of places. Um, and that meant that gave us the licence. So there was a the great relief, right, you're away. You can go and uh, get the project going. So I stuck with the Mediterranean. I thought it was a rich, a rich place to start because firstly it's not as expensive as all the others and it meant I could tell big interesting stories. So we've done the geology, and then what about the megafauna and sharks? Well, not many people know that in the Med, uh, these big sharks have got six gills, and six gill sharks are really rare. You've got them off the, um, the Pacific Northwest. There's a few places they come up from about 2,500 metres, and every once in a while at a new moon, no one knows why they come up, to a new, come up on a new moon, they come up to about 50 metres, 
and disappear again. And there's been little fleeting glances. Divers have had glimpses of them that have been filmed from submarines, that have been filmed from remote-operated vehicles. But it hasn't been, in television terms, the classic two-shot, where someone is with this thing, speaking about it and why it's important. So we went to the Straits of Messina, which is between Sicily and Italian mainland, where there have been them. And I had a number of dives getting nowhere. You can imagine what it's like. You go down there, it's very deep water. I'd sort of level out about 45 metres, drift along in the current, just black, nothing. And we'd come up and I had three or four dives like that and basically ran out of time before it happened to find a needle in a haystack. And I remember our producer at the time saying, you know, Paul, we, we can't travel around the world with you not finding things. Um, we're going to have to get the thing on this dive or forget it. So we, we put together a big, I was using open circuit scuba, so we put together big cylinders, uh, over blew them, you can, you, can over blow, you can pump them up a little bit, 10% more sometimes, blew them up, went when the current was really ripping at night so that I would travel more ground and have more air, so therefore extend the possibilities. And as we went out, our Sicilian boat captain, he's, he was a great man, lovely man, he said, you know, how do you know that this shark's going to come to you anyway? Because there's seven, of, seven people in the water to make it look as if I'm on my own. I've got my safety diver, two cameramen, the lighting men, their safety divers. And I remember saying, well, we're just going to get lucky, you know. And Anne, our producer, was at the front of the boat and I could see her, you know, anxious and let's get on with this thing. And he said, you know what? And he went to the back of the boat and he got a big lump. It's about eight kilo lump of fresh tuna. And he says, you want to tie that on your weight belt? And I'm thinking, Phew, you know, I'm well committed here, but these are predatory sharks, they're the size of a great white. And I remember thinking, well, I am committed, but pff, not sure about that. And, I, and it was amazing. And then out of the dark, my risk averse producer, I heard a yell, that's it, get it on him, get it on him, get it on him. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter anymore. Just, you know. So sure enough, I got very lucky. You had about half an hour dive with nothing. And then the last 10 minutes of the dive, you, you see it on the film, you can't see it, but their eyes are green. And these two huge, beautiful green eyes came up. And we had this beautiful sort of 10 minutes together where I, I was in the two shot with a six year old shark. Um, and with megafauna, you can't go wrong with stories like that. I mean, I was in Mozambique, I've been trying to tell stories of the symbiotic relationship that exists on the reef. Um, you, you, you must be aware that you know, a lot of big fish rely on small fish for getting their gills and leading edges and mouth parts cleaned. And this symbiotic relationship, when, in, when you mention symbiotic sometimes in television circles, they go, oh God big long word, you know, we're not interested. But it, by telling it in Mozambique, where there's 500 of these mantas, and they pull into this part of the reef and get their leading edges cleaned by the fish, they pull in another part of the reef and get their mouth parts and gill, gills cleaned, and then here, they pull up and get these big shark bites cleaned, because 80% of the mantas have got enormous bull shark bites at the back end. And when they pull up on the last cleaning station. It's a bit like walking down a high street on a Saturday. You get your hair cut over here, you have, go to the gym over there and you go over there. So it's a lovely way of sort of telling this very important, interesting, curious story about symbiotic relationships and the, the special fish, the lovely little butterfly fish that, that, that live off the bacteria on those wounds. But in doing so, that cleans the wounds and keeps the mantas alive. So we're always looking for these kinds of tricks and some fall really easy and some fall really difficult. With, with the oceans, I was trying to tell the story that four billion years ago, our oceans weren't the life-giving, energy, th oxygen-rich things we know today. They were black, anoxic, lifeless places. And the things that helped bring them back were called stromatolites, which are lumps. I mean, these are active ones in Bahamas. They look very active, but they are. And we all went to the Bahamas, and I swam around and put an oximeter on them, and then the number went up from zero to uh, 0.02. I said, look, you know, this is producing oxygen. It's, you know, bloody fantastic. And, and you know, the, the, the television people are like, not remotely interested. They say, God, it's the worst bit of television we've ever seen. <laughs> so, so I needed a way to get someone else excited. Um, so I went back to the Bahamas to Andros. And this isn't the best picture, but this is, a, this is called the black hole of Andros. And unlike holes that you think about, blue holes that lead to the sea, this is completely black. And the scientist there, a friend of mine, Steffi Schwab, she was going out, rowing out there, lowering down bottles, and coming up from 50 metres was water that's the same chemically as our oceans were four billion years ago. I think, well, how can this be? 
How can that possibly be? It's not the same water, because all the geological movement, but it's the same chemically. So I thought, right, that's all we need. And it's in the Bahamas, because I was trying to do the whole Atlantic story. So we got there and jumped in, and I had the dive expecting to go into black water at about 50 metres. And I got down to about 17 metres where this picture's taken, and I thought, I'm on the bottom. Can you believe it? So I figured I must be on a ledge. And it was a bit cloudy, so I kept moving around out to the middle, and, and I was still on the bottom. I like, gosh, there's something wrong here. And then I realised that I was actually sinking into the bottom. I thought, that's really, I have never had this before. And it was really warm. It was really uncomfortably hot. It was like middle 30s. I thought, why is hot this? Hot water. See, and I was just... And I could feel myself slowly easing down. I, so then, if you know divers, you can make yourself heavy. If you don't, you, you can just dump air as your non-divers and you can just sort of sink. So I did some tests and I could feel myself going down in like this hot potato soup. I thought, why oh, is this just amazing? So I kept at it. And um, <laughs> as I did so, I could... I could, f you can't smell anything when you're diving because your nose is in here, but I could feel myself being permeated with rotten eggs. I thought, this is really weird, you know, I feel this taste rotten eggs. And I kept going down and down and forcing myself, it felt really claustrophobic to be in this thick, you know, I could barely move in it. And after quite a long way, about the height of, of the theatre here, um, I started to get a different feel, a sort of light above me. And then I popped into refreshingly cool Black water, completely black water. And we did all the samples in the dives and we proved that's, that's water, the same chemical as four billion years old. So it's a very complicated thing to film because, you know, I'm supposed to be talking to the camera. I couldn't even find the camera. And we, you know, and then we, so we got up and we rehearsed it and we went down and because Mike wanted to get me coming up and going down and going down, coming up. And the whole idea was to make a sequence of this. So we did it all day. We had four dives. And at the end of these dives, I remember thinking, God, I don't feel very well. I, I felt really weird. And Mike, you know, was saying, look, the camera, all the shiny bits on the camera have gone black. Uh, and all the shiny bits of my diving gear have gone black. And, and I just felt really weird. And, my, and Mike said, hey, look at you. And my hair had gone gold, bright gold. And uh, we had no idea. But this, that, what's causing that layer is hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. And that's so aggressive, it's not letting anything down in there. Uh, to live, and of course what we also didn't know is it's a topically absorbent neurotoxin, um, which as you can see has done me no harm whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but, but it's one of those dives, you know, I would love to have, I'd love to do that six gill dive again any day, because it was so beautiful, but in my life of about 8,000 dives, I would never ever go near this thing again, but at least we told the story, and then I, ha I had to suffer the embarrassment on board the ship in the Bahamas, because we filmed things out of sequence sometimes, of the, the team saying, we're going to have to dye your hair. I go, oh, God. So then we, there we are in Grand Bahama getting black hair dye to go on top of the gold and go, oh, it's gone ginger. Hey, you know, and, oh, shit, and brown. And, and eventually got the hair back to more or less where it was and we could, we could carry on filming. Um, and when we're talking about big issues like the age of the ocean and geology, we need a way to bring it into a human scale and touch it and feel it. And we were blessed in Italy because I was keen to tell the audience that there are volcanoes that are very active in the Med under the water. And this one in Italian waters called Ferdinandea, through the course of history, has been up quite a bit. And when it pops up, everybody claims it, apparently. Um, you know, the, 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 the Italians claim it, they call it Ferdinandea. The French claim it, they call it Julien Island. We imaginatively claim it and call it Graham Island to fit with all the other Graham Islands there are in the world. So it's a nice sort of quirky bit of of geology gets people interested. And then, beautifully enough, um, for television anyway, I hate to say it, the, the Americans bombed it in 1986 because they thought it was a submarine in support of Libya, so it's marvellous, you know. <laughs> these are the kind of things that, that, we, that we love on television because we we're suddenly talking about volcanology under the water, but people are listening thinking, what, what the heck can this be? Similarly, in the Sea of Cortez, I remember the days of, of you know, this many hammerhead from the old Cousteau programmes whizzing around over the seamounts, and I figured that we needed a way to go back to the old Cousteau days, Cousteau days, and this is what the hammerheads used to be like, and the fact that now there's hardly any. In fact, most people don't find any. And where have they gone? We've fished them. They go with the 100 million sharks that we kill every year for our appetite for shark fin soup. And I, 
I didn't want to be just another person sort of pointing a finger um, at the audience as that we've got to find a way around it. So I decided to tell the story in an odd way and it was I went down looking for hammerheads and quite obviously didn't find them. Had some big long dives on my rebreather, three and a half hour dives, no hammerheads. But they've been replaced by these things which are, you know, the, nature's always in balance. When the shark's gone, what took its place were these giant Humboldt squid and they are big. They're as big as a person. Very aggressive, very weird to dive with. They've got big beaks, they fly fast, they communicate by light. They, when you go down through them, as you look up, you say they've suddenly formed a big thick ceiling above you. And they come at you at night very fast. And worst of all for someone like me is their eyes are the same construction as human eyes. So not only have they got big brains, big eyes, big teeth, aggressive things, but they actually look as if, you, as if they know what you're up to. So it's a hell of a thing to be around underwater, <laughs> hundreds of these things. But it worked for television because rather than me talk about shark finning, the audience could see me having a really hell of a difficult time dealing with these awful beasts. So it was the way of sort of finding these funny little ways to get the audience to watch us. And similarly in the Sea of Cortez, um, I was very worried about these people. These are the Seri Indians, um, beautiful people, the indigenous people in the northern part of the Sea of Cortez, uh, who've been given a special license to fish for scallops, scallops um, diving. Normally you can't, because a bit of a license in keeping the, the fish stock sustainable. But the Mexican government give this, these tribal people the opportunity to fish using diving gear. And I was really worried about the way we were covering it, television-wise. The, the crew were tired, it was the end of a long month in the Sea of Cortez, and there was a sense of, let's just knock this off and go home. And I'd met these people before, and they're, they're an Inuit group caught between time zones. You know, you see it all over the world. They've, they've, some of them are taking good advantage of, 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 of modern day activities and development, and some haven't. So there's alcoholism, drug use, there's this whole sort of mix in there. But I love them, beautiful people. So we were going out for a dive, and there's the diver. There's his dad, who's a sort of village shaman. And this is the diving gear, and it's a, it's a lawnmower engine on a paint sprayer compressor, um, running a garden hose to an aluminium beer barrel, and on the end of that is a 100 metre long hose, and the diver breathes through a really awful looking second stage. So it's horribly dangerous diving. Even if you look at the dive profile, as we call it, it's really super aggressive. Plus, these compressors aren't like diving compressors. These are lubricated with oil. And tiny bits of oil do get past those rings, and they do get this lipoid pneumonia on their lungs. So it's very risky, horrible diving. Um, but I wanted to make the point that they were uh, very proud, beautiful people. And when we got there, with this, my crew going bananas, you know, just want to knock this thing off. We were going out and the shaman there, the diver's dad, sang. And he sang beautifully. It wasn't just like what could be random chanting. It was beautiful, beautiful song. Obviously about the weather and, you know, safe fishing and safe diving and all that. But I don't know what he was singing, but it was beautiful. And I was spooled up on the boat and I was laying on the boat thinking, God, I hope we cover this properly. And when he stopped, it it seemed like the world was ringing with silence. It was just beautiful. And there he was, he'd just sung his song and we were gonna dive. And I was so spooled up that when he went to me like that, now in the cold light of that, I'm, I realized he meant, what did you think of that? Thanks very much. But I thought he meant, over to you. And I went, oh God. So I stood up and I, and I, and I sang something called Nelly the Elephant, which is a really crap. <laughs> Um, uh, children's song, but I felt families. I was so overwhelmed with 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 the sort of beauty and power of the moment, and I was up there, and I was singing and dancing, nearly, and he was loving it and all clapped. But my crew, who I'd you know sort of berated before, God bless them, didn't film it, and uh, so it's not on television. So, you know, I always use that as a sort of method to sort of explain, you know, what happens when you get overwhelmed by the situation when you're trying to communicate very complicated issues. So uh, that's me. Um, I'm Paul Rose and I invite your um, difficult questions and uh, uh, inquiring minds. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have some people with microphones. We're recording this. So if you have a question, um, identify yourself.
Oh yeah, I'll take questions on anything. Oh yeah. Oh yes, yeah. We just have to wait for the mic so it gets picked up on the recording, probably. Yeah, great. Great. Hi, uh, that was fantastic. Um, I wonder uh, now that I have a live person here from out of an ocean documentary, uh, which I'm a big fan of. Um, I can ask you, the, the end of the, the, these documentaries are always so depressing because they always say, you know, and, you know, the only enemy of the hammerhead shark is man. Yeah. And, you know, you, and, and, and it, they're very depressing. They, they talk yeah. about the, the garbage patches and all of this yeah. stuff. And, it's, and yeah. you know, you get so you can barely watch them because yeah. you know what's coming. And you know it's true. Yeah. And so where's, is there hope, I guess, is the question, because that's always what I want to know at the end of these things, because it never seems like it. Yeah, that's a brilliant comment, and I agree wholeheartedly. And there is hope, because I look at the next generation. I really do. I'm, I'm working a lot with the next generation. I always look at them, and I, I, s I see the next 30 years being some really smart solutions coming in place. For instance, um, the overfishing, we're really getting somewhere now. Um, you know, I was just in Hong Kong again, and there's, a, there's the, the appetite for shark fin soup is still there because it used to be that that if you if you went out and sort of barehanded got a shark that then you know you you had the right to the fin and that was it sort of given as a as a thing well because if that still existed we'd be all right but against the background of it of commercial it doesn't work but with the benefit of social networking and the pressure that comes from instant communication we are really getting somewhere even in places like hong kong you still sit on the menu, you can still go in restaurants and there's a display case with shark fins in it. But we are getting somewhere. And similarly with plastic in the oceans, we, a lot of people know about it now. There's lots of clever solutions coming up. And even when we talk about the depressing fact that when the, when the plastic goes so small it becomes a micro pollutant, it then oddly enough becomes a magnet for other toxins. And then the fish get it and we have it in us. There isn't a cup of water in the oceans that doesn't have plastic in it. And so it's in us, obviously, it's in the food chain. But I feel we are getting somewhere. I feel we have a chance of stopping the problem, which is the main thing. We're raising awareness, we're stopping the problem. When we talk about climate change, we're coming up with very clever, innovative adaptations to say the Arctic within all of our lives is going to be unrecognisable. But transarctic shipping is a very sensible, sustainable adaptation. And if we do that the right way, our generation will set a really high bar, a really high standard. The young ones come up thinking, you know what? The way they handled the Arctic changes was really great. The sensitivities to, to the indigenous people, the sensitivities to establishing pristine baseline studies, the very clean, smart, efficient trans-Arctic ship. And these are, I see these as opportunities for us to set the next, next example for the young ones coming through. So I feel we're getting there. I really do. I'm incredibly optimistic about these kinds of things. I don't think it's blind optimism. I'll, I'll leave blind optimism to my rock climbing. I'm constantly falling off rock, but... Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I think we're getting there, and it's a very, very important um, comment that you've made, something that's very close to my heart. Thanks very much, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, hey, thanks. When, when you were looking in the Mediterranean for signs of uh, high water and low water, uh, did, you, did you check out Malta? Because there's lots of ruins down below the water line, yes. quite a lot way, long way down below the water line, which I think would explain that water was much lower at one time. Exactly, um, and, and I've dived those, those areas off of Gozo and Malta itself, down to those lovely ruins, you know, and we decided in the end to not cover them because they wanted the trade and human impact on the Mediterranean to be covered by us diving shipwrecks. So we did the whole trade story and the ship design and, and all that business. So we, we were going to do that. And for television purposes, the cave diving worked a bit better because it was a bit more powerful. And classic television, the soundtrack to that thing is all doom and gloom. And, uh, you know, and the voiceover is all about death and getting stuck and running out of there. You know, so, so actually, the cave, but we, do, we do know about the Malta. And I've dived those areas around the back of Gozo as well. Yeah, beautiful. Have you dived there? Have you? No, I, I don't do diving, but I was aware of them. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think with television, the more sort of riveting, the better, in many ways. You know how? Yeah. Well, I find that riveting enough. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Thanks. This is unusual. Normally, with a roving mic, they're like, aren't they? 
or lots of different places. But here, people are pretty, that's very uh, yeah. J yeah. Just going inland a bit, uh, what sort of submersible uh, uh, work has been done in Lake Baikal? This, uh, this man, um, Anatoly Sagalevich, he's been to the bottom of Lake Baikal. Yeah, yeah. yeah in that submarine, yeah. Uh, he's, well, he's a hero, you know. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he is, yeah, he's Lake Baikal. He's, he's the one that does it. And um, it's, it, it's great stuff and it captures the imagination. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So it's you know it's things like this, and of course if we hear that as a s statistic, because we're connected and interested, if we get it. But for a broadcasting, why not get a submarine in there, dive to the bottom, and then tell the story? Which is exactly what Anatoly did. Yeah, yeah, hero of Russia. I <laughs> just love it. Yeah. Oh, if, <laughs> yes. Hi. Good making you run now. Yes, that's the. I was explaining earlier, normally in a, in, a, in a big public lecture, you know, large theatre, I often get the, the adults, you know, professors and whatnot, saying, how do you go to the toilet at minus 40 on Mount Erebus? And the, and the 11 year olds going, how do you know the methane you collected in, in, in Greenland is from, not, is, is from clathrates and not from animals or plants? <laughs> yeah. So you never know what's going to come, you know. So yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's yeah. Okay. Um, so it's my understanding that in some um, coastal Greenland towns, it's common practice to push the waste and um, into the ocean. Yep. So I was wondering if you'd done any outreach locally in Greenland about trash um, or had considered doing that at all? Yeah, well, as, as I'm now living a debris-filled life, it seems, um, I have up at Constable Point. Uh, have you been to Constable Point? We, it's very easy, accessible. You know, it's one of these places that's easy. You can fly in from Iceland. You can connect with any flight in Greenland. Flying is a great, great, you know, sort of kilometre and a half long gravel strip, and it's a good field centre. Then it's a good hub for prospecting. You know, rare earths, minerals, diamonds, you name it. It's a great site for science because you can get in, and it's a tremendous site for people that are, say, going to the Watkins Mountains guiding or, or climbing in Renland or doing big ski journeys. So it's a lovely hub. And then just down the coast is Itakortamit, which is the Inuit village. It's beautiful. But for years, what they do with their rubbish, it's the old story. We've got money and resources to take, take stuff in, but we don't seem to have the space, the money and resources to get rid of it. And it's heartbreak. It's absolute heartbreak. I sort of go to Itakortamit and it, I can see it in my mind that it's almost sort of making sense because the villagers there, they haven't got much money, they're getting by, they've got this whole, although they're self-ruled, they've got the Danish crown colony thing going on so they're getting social support. There's, there is a lot of sort of habit, if you like, about throwing stuff away. I can sort of get it. Um, but a constable point, which are us going in and tourists spending thousands of dollars and mining companies spending millions, you go around, you know, to the wharf where there's a, there's a, the, the ships pull in and, it, and you can use it for small boats and whatnot. And there's a dump. And on this dump, there's everything. I mean, everything you can imagine is on that dump. Now, things like aluminium ladders, bits of vehicles and all that big lumps. Again, you can sort of see these bits of metal being fairly benign. And then you go around the ditch and what's in the ditch? Oil filters, batteries, you know, labels of Hascam stuff with, with water running off down the tundra, down the thing into our pristine oceans. Unbelievable. And in Ilulisat, I've worked a lot in Ilulisat, there's the, there's the, well, I hate to call it, it's the most beautiful rubbish dump in the world. <laughs> it's a lovely rubbish dump. In Ilulisat with the iceberg factory, icebergs going past, whales, fantastic. And there's this dump with all, and it's all going down into the sea. So with Constable Point, um, I've agreed, I'm, I'm racing next year in one of these big Arctic ultra marathon things, you know, big sort of four day, hundred mile ski race thing. And um, I'm basing it, uh, I'm, my team, we're going to be based at Constable Point. So the visibility they're getting from it, they've agreed that we can do a clean-up campaign that won't embarrass them or the locals or the companies that work there. So there's all these sensitivities. Because you go and clean it up and then what's the public feeling about how they did it? So we're just working out how to do it. And obviously we're going to use uh, teams from Itacortimit and it will be their initiative. So just as we use pristine baseline studies to get people excited about other parts of nature, we're going to use this as a best practice thing instituted by the locals and all that. But it's heartbreaking. It's unbelievable. It's terrible. I stand, I'll take, I've got so many pictures of that Constable Point dump. <laughs> you know, Chris, you've been there. Yeah, <sighs> amazing. It's funny, isn't it? Got the money to get it in and not to get it out sometimes.
Yeah. You see, you're right. It is a, my de life is overwhelmed by debris now. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right, I'll take. Yes, I'll take questions on anything. Uh, comments. Oh, yes. How many of the world's cities are sending garbage scows out to sea and dumping regularly? Yeah, it's a good comment. I don't know I, how many. I think New York does daily. I was wondering, does that, does that? Not anymore? Not anymore, you said, yeah. Well, it's interesting because I was just in Hong Kong. And, um, you know, it's a great place to be. There's a big sense of power underneath that city. But they haven't quite got this. They don't recycle much waste at all. It's too complicated because it's just such compact living areas. You know, they use landfill and dump stuff at sea. Um, I mean, there's an enormous amount of stuff. When you see the computer modelling for the Plastic Oceans exhibit and you see where all this stuff comes from, uh, river-located river cities and how it all comes in, it's just amazing. So we do, there's this sort of, the oceans are so big, we don't understand it, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, it's, it becomes a bot bottomless pit for all of our wastes. And that's the way we have treated the ocean. Um, so it's quite some awful legacy, really. But I feel there lies the opportunity for uh, us to set the right standard of intent and, and, and actual action, um, and also uh, raise the awareness for the young ones coming through. So it needs to be young, there's no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. Can you tell me about polar bear, the ship that you saw? Polar bear, yes. Oh, thanks for, uh, God bless you, thanks for asking. The polar bear yacht um, yes. is a beautiful steel, 72 foot long yacht that I use up in the Arctic. It's not my boat, it's owned by a dear friend of mine. And I use it up in the Arctic and also use it for ocean yacht racing. There's a big ocean yacht race called the Fastnet, which is the sort of Grand Prix of, and I race her on that, um, and will be again this year as well, August. So she's a beautiful steel boat. Was that she on the upper left photograph? Yeah. Yes, that was, yes. <laughs> that was us on the fast net. So she's beautiful, very fast, very big, very powerful, fantastic. And uh, yeah, I, I love to sail, and um, I must say, uh, you know, running her in the Fastnet is a great thrill, and, and I brought her back from Norway through to England and got a race ready and sailed her down. Yeah, she's a fantastic fast thing. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, Ross. Thanks. Uh, hi, thank you for coming today. Um, on a different note, um, I'm wondering about how big is the jump in terms of demands from uh, recreational diving to technical diving, and how large also is the gap for... Um, uh, for um, opportunities to, to see foreign environments from what's within recreational limits to what's within technical limits. Yeah, it's a great one. That, you know, what is the difference, you know, how big is that gap between recreational diving and technical diving? And actually, it's not a very big gap practically. You know, using the kit and, get, and understanding the gas laws again and again and again and really understanding what's going on with your gear is something that anybody can do. But where the gap is large is the mental awareness you know, it's, it's actually, technical diving used to be really quite complicated, practically. So because it was practically difficult to go buy helium, and because it was really complicated to buy the right kind of regulators and all this other business, we were making it ourselves and jury rigging all kinds of stuff together. So that engaged us very slowly in the mental shift. So now you can actually go, I mean, my rebreather is good for 100 metres, and you can go in the shop, plop down your money, pick up something, put it in your back, and go kill yourself, you know. Uh, there's, you think, well, shit, you know, it's, it's so easy to use and so easy to hurt yourself. But it isn't a big shift, and I encourage you to do it. Are you a technical diver now, do you think? No, but, but yeah, go for it. It's good, yeah. It's a, it, it, the gear's good. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. You know, we're diving at 100 metres now, whereas, you know, 100 metre dive used to be an enormously hostile place to be. But we can dive at 100 metres now with, without losing sleep the night before. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity because, interesting, we're learning a lot about the deep abyss now. We are getting there. And we, learn, we've, we understand a lot of what's happening in the 50 metre range. Most nearshore marine biology occurs in 50 metres. But where the big gap is, is what's between 50 and 300. That whole range is an enormous world. And we're still discovering new species just like that. So there's lots of opportunity with brand new, every dive being a world's first. 
in any old spot on the planet that's below 50 meters, really. Yeah. Oh, yes. Th thanks, Ross. Yeah. Great. Um, I haven't heard anything in a long time about the issue of dumping nuclear waste in the ocean. Uh, back in the late 90s, I w rented a room to a Russian student here who had been in the Russian Navy, Great. and he told me stories about the captain telling him to dump nuclear waste in the ocean. And um, he would say, we're not supposed to, and the captain would say, dump it. <laughs> yeah. So what are the issues now regarding nuclear waste from submarines and so on in the ocean? Well, when I live, I live half the time in England and half in Switzerland. And when I'm in England, I'm in, the, in Cumbria in the northwest, which is a beautiful national park. And on the edge of the Lake District uh, National Park is a big nuclear plant. And that plant had a history of really bad problems, water leaks, uh, discharging of waste into the North Sea, the Irish Sea rather, and a, a really terrible history and some really frightening airborne exposure as well. So, you know, what did the government do at the time is they changed its name. <laughs> so, you know, right, change its name so the reputation changes. And then also next to it, they built a huge uh, nuclear reprocessing plant. So w one of the big incomes for that part of Britain is we import nuclear waste and store it safely. Well, what's happening is there's an enormous debate about the safety of underground storage. Are we really confident about the geology? Do we really know what we're doing with this stuff? And so I'm engaged in a bit of that debate because I'm very active in the local community. I'm under thinking, what? So I did some research, and there's apparently the um, nuclear regulatory committees from all over the world have an agreement of what consists of safe long-term storage for our waste. It's a, so you can imagine it's a broad braced policy. Safe nuclear waste is this, and that's agreed universally. And I asked at this last meeting how many of them there are in the world. There isn't one. So everyone agrees that this is safe, but somehow we haven't figured out how to build one. We haven't got one. There's not one on the planet. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm completely amazed. As to, I mean, I'm actually a bit of a sort of closet fan of nuclear fuel and the way it works, because you see it work and you think well, there's a lot of potential here and I don't quite understand why we don't use the reprocessed waste as energy for another kind of power generation. I haven't quite figured that out in my head, very basic questions. But what I can't figure out is how we can you know, dump it, literally just dump it in the sea. I don't know how much is going on right now, but um, whatever was put there is still there, isn't it? And is there a chance of us actually getting it off the sea bottom without um, killing ourselves or disrupting. Who knows? Um, there's another challenge. Where's the young ones? Oh, there you are. <laughs> but it's a brilliant comment. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. So I, want to, I want to thank everyone, remind the students, all the students, young and old, the, uh, <laughs> Sorry. the reception at uh, Dickey Center. We were following, and there's lots of good food there. So if you're hungry, join us. If you just want a good talk, join us too. And I want to thank Paul for an amazingly entertaining and thoughtful and right. constructive <laughs> presentation. Thank thanks, you. Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you. Thanks. That's good fun, Ross. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ross.